Hello, a very good evening. Three minutes past nine is the time on LBC. Um, about ten years ago, I first met Amanda Prouse. Um, she had published a book called Poppy Day, and um, it was a really, really good book, and I introduced her to a literary agent, and um, since then her career has just, well... Was it 2.4 million books did I read? Was uh, that nearly right? Nearly eight, Ian. But I don't, eight million. I, yeah, but I don't want to be million. braggy, but nearly eight, you oh know. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> well, that is... And you, and you write two books a year. You mm. are very prolific. And you have become a bit of a media star as well. And you and I have appeared on Jeremy Vine's Channel 5 show together a couple of times. Um, I had no idea when we appeared on that show what you were going through what your family were going through, and you've written about it now. And at this point, I want to introduce Josh, real name Josiah, <laughs> Josiah Hartley, because you've written this book together. It's called The Boy Between, A Mother and Son's Journey from a World Gone Grey. And it's a, it's really quite a difficult subject I, for both of you to write about, I think. Before we tell your story, I want to know, first of all, why did you decide to write about the book? Because you, you've opened up your family to the public, which, I mean, there are other members of the family, are obviously your, your husband, Simeon, your brother, Ben, um, grand, your parents, et cetera, et cetera. Um, Josh, why did you want to tell the story? When I was suffering, I felt completely alone. And initially, due to my own ignorance around depression, I didn't realise just how common it was. And I thought, if I can reach one person suffering right now and let them know that they're not alone, it's completely worth it. And in a way, that is why... I've covered mental health so much on my programme over the last 10 years because I think it's changed an awful lot over the last 10 years in that even then people were slightly reluctant to talk about it. We've had today the news that the Welsh Tory leader, Andrew R.T. Davis, has decided mm. to take a break because of his own mental health issues. He would never have said that in public 10 years ago. So, and, it, and it's because of books like this that I think it, it gives people the confidence to do so. Um where should we start? It's, it's such a difficult one, isn't it? Because you, you, you start literally um, right at the beginning when Josh was a baby and you talk about his childhood and it sort of all sounds incredibly idyllic in many ways. When Josh, when did you first realise as a child that, that you had depressive issues? Because it, it's not really until halfway through the book where you actually acknowledged that it was depression. You, you thought it was, well, goodness knows what, initially... It's not, it's not very easy for me to admit this, but I didn't believe depression was real when I was younger. I didn't know the difference between prolonged mild sadness and clinical depression. And I think partly that ignorance allowed, allowed it to fully take hold of my life. And I think I was probably 16 when depression now, as, the, as now I'd call it, mm. uh, fully entered my life. I think even from a very young age, even a toddler, I was perhaps a bit more thoughtful than most kids, a bit more introspective, but sadder I'd say than most kids but certainly not depressed but then at 15 16 I think that's when full-blown depression came into my life and, and when someone first said to you you've got depression I mean in a, if I've remembered rightly you, you say in the book that it was a bit of a light bulb moment and you thought oh so it's not me yeah it became aware that it's it's a wider problem and for enough someone else acknowledging that really helped me because I felt even at that time, I felt completely alone. I felt like I was suffering by myself and there wasn't, you know, unfortunately thousands of people suffering in exactly the same way I was. Mm. Um, whether it's a university hall or at a school, multiple people, probably in the same corridor even, are suffering just as much as you are. So for someone to put a label onto it, it did help me a lot. Um, when did you first realise that there was something different? I think um, Josh was always super smart, very funny, um, quite insightful, quite adult really, but not jolly, not laughing a lot. And I, I do and I am. You do. I'm a real glass half full kind of gal. Very annoying to have around at six in the morning <laughs> when everyone else is trying to, you know, recover. But um, I think I was just aware that there was a hesitancy in Josh to join in. So I thought, is he autistic? Is he uh, dyslexic? Are there social issues? Is it anxiety? What's going on here? Um, and obviously those things take a while to, to rise to the surface before you can fully get diagnosed. Josh was diagnosed with depression, uh, with uh, dyslexia quite early on, weren't you, Josh? And his dyslexia is severe. 
So I thought, well, that's what it is. That's his thing, that's his label, and that's what we stuck on him. Mm. And I thought that depression was what happened to other families because I was, uh, I was what I'd call, you know, one of those confident mums who thinks, well, I eat with my kids, we take them on holiday, I know their friends, I keep them warm, they're well fed, we know each other. Nothing would ever come out of the woodwork that I wasn't fully prepared for. Smug mum. You see them, don't you? I was a smug mum. Everything was great. Two fantastic kids, lovely family, everything perfect. It turns out we are other people. And it absolutely pulled the rug from under us because it's interesting when Josh talks about being given the label of depression. When we finally got a diagnosis for Josh, I then didn't know what to do with that information because I thought, well, OK, um, if depression exists, then what, what do I do? Why don't we take Josh for a nice walk? Why don't we, you know, where's the doctor that can fix it? Where's the, the magic tablet? Where's the retreat? You know, what's the process we undergo to get him better? And I sort of think I rushed headlong into fix-it mode because that's how I'd always parented. Mm. You know, if they forgot their kit, I'll take it to school. If they haven't got a packed lunch, I'll rustle something up. If they're cold, I'll make them tea, I'll get them a blanket. You know, fix-it mum, in the way that my mum parented me, making everything as nice and safe and nest-like as I, as I possibly could. Um, and did you find that sometimes a bit overwhelming, Josh? Extremely overwhelming. When you can't lift your head off the pillow and you can't think even hours into the future, as someone saying to you, just go for a walk, it's, it's comical. It's like asking someone to climb Everest with no training. So to think happiness lied on a beach in Spain somewhere was just farcical. It was just made me feel even more alone, isolated. Because if your own mother doesn't know what's going on in your head, how can you expect the wider society to kind of understand what you're going through at that moment. So, you know, at the at the worst points of my depression, no, it, it did not help at all. Sleep is, I think, the, the one word that permeates this whole book, isn't it? In that, that you just wanted to sleep all the time. And, and I suspect that, in a sense, that's quite typical for, for people with depression. And but the, the reaction that you got from maybe some of your wider family members who couldn't understand, why is, he, why is he always asleep? Why doesn't he go and get a job? Why doesn't he do this? Why doesn't he do... And that just imposes even more pressure. I was sleeping over 18 hours a day at points, and that was the... I'd e love to do that. <laughs> <laughs> and that was the easiest, um, healthiest way for me to put my life on pause at yeah. that time. It was either extreme drinking or sleeping, and extreme sleeping's a lot more sustainable. Um, but it is, it is tough when people are saying, why don't you just get a job, just go for a walk, just do this. But when you, you literally can't get your head off the pillow without just this sense of dread on the, and just this darkness just enveloping you, it's, it's really hard. One of the other things that I, I mean, I don't know if you'll agree with this or not, but to me, in this book, there are two Joshes. There's the Josh that's experiencing it all. And then there's sort of the Josh that's looking on from above that kind of recognises what's going on, but doesn't know what to do about it, in that you know that something's wrong, and you know that something's got to be done to change it, but you can't quite get to the stage of doing it. I've always been an extremely logical person, and science has always been my passion, but when it's when it's your the thing that's broken, yeah. it's very hard to be logical. And um, I just didn't see a solution, I didn't see a way out for a lot of that time. And I think that's partly due to the shame I felt and partly due to the sense of just wider society as a man, things that are expected of a young man that I just felt really alienated. I didn't feel like I was up to scratch, if you like. I didn't feel like I could join in with just normal society at that point. So it was just easy for me to just shut away, not ask for help, almost pretend I didn't exist. Uh, and when you were quite young, um, Amanda, you... Um you found a new partner, and it was somebody, a, a, a parent of a boy at, at Josh's school. Um, just take us through that, because I thought that was one of the most fascinating parts of the book, where how you built this new family, where Josh had a new brother who's, I think, exactly the same age. And, I mean, that could have been quite destabilising, but actually it proved to be the opposite. It did, yeah. I mean, when Josh was little, he'd always say... I'd really like a brother, but I want one the same age as me. And I'd say, well, it doesn't quite work like that, love. Um, and, I, yeah, I met and fell in love with Simeon. And Ben and Josh were in the same class at school. And it was not without 
issues. Obviously, no new family just springs up. It's not like the Brady Bunch, you know, where there's canned laughter and knee-high socks and swishy blonde hair and everything's fabulous. There was a lot of um, turmoil and trying to sort of pull together these two kids who went like just normal brothers quite quickly. They either loved each other or hated each other. That was quite, you know, quite standard. Mm. I've grown up with brothers and that was sort of how it was. Um, But Josh was rightly wary of changing our little tiny dynamic because there was just two of us. And we had a very close, uh, probably an intense relationship, I would say, because it was just Josh and I, really. I mean, you know, notwithstanding the fact my parents have helped enormously in Josh's upbringing. But um, it felt good to suddenly be from two to four. And the trouble is, I, I felt I was losing control a little bit of my child. And when depression and mental illness did start to knock on our door, and my husband uh, dealt with it brilliantly, I felt quite, I felt quite jealous because I, and that's a terrible thing to say because I adore Simeon and I adore Josh and I adore Ben. But I did feel quite jealous because I'd always thought my job was to fix Josh. That was down to me. And the fact that someone else was so brilliantly coping with it. He happens to be a soldier. And I think actually he's just better trained and also slightly removed from that relationship. I can't imagine anyone being able to train you, frankly. <laughs> but, uh... <laughs> You'd be surprised. If there was hobnobs in it here and I'd do most things. Um, but did, did you hard. feel at all... This is my fault. He's my oh. child. And therefore, yeah. it must have been something that I've done. Or, I mean, I know a lot of parents of gay children blame, blame in inverted commas, themselves for the fact that their child has turned out to be gay. Yeah. I didn't, I didn't feel that slightly. I was consumed by it. You know, what was it I had done to make my child feel sad? Because... Mm. I thought I was doing everything right. Because you are the right. least sad person I know. Yeah, no matter what, I can always find a bit of a silver lining um, because that's just how I'm programmed, mm. I now know. Um, and I felt enormous guilt over it and, I, and a, an enormous sense of failure because I'd let Josh down, because I'd had my eye off the ball, because things had slipped through the net, whatever you know, other metaphor you want to throw at it. It had to be my fault because I was responsible for Josh and his happiness. Um, and it took me years. I still, even now... Funny enough, probably because I was coming on today, I had a dream last night. And I haven't. I said to Josh, Josh remembers, I spoke to Josh earlier and I said, I dreamt that you were one and you were sitting on my lap and we were in the back of a car and I was saying to you, everything's going to be okay, you know. Everything's always going to be okay. And it's almost like I was doing a rerun. And I woke up feeling really great and thought, maybe if I'd done more of that. So even now, when Josh is in a fairly good place, he's 24, you know, we're, we're sort of... Not out the other side, because we never will be, but things are better. I still feel that guilt in. I think I always will. And Josh, were you aware that your mother felt like that? Yeah, not not initially, but after after living in the same house for a few months, um, absolutely. And that only put more pressure on what was already a, a quite a tense situation. Mm. Um, I knew I had to get better for myself, but I also felt pressure on them to get better for them as well. Um, if you've ever lived in a house with depression you know you can't escape from it it's in every room it sucks the joy and the light out of everything you do and I felt like such a burden at that time and um it was weird because I fully blamed myself um I thought I'd done something so big and so bad that even I couldn't see it and this my depression was a punishment for something I'd done which looking back I know just isn't the case it's interesting this word blame is is thrown around a lot in, in in these discussions isn't it and of course there is, it's that famous Howard Jones song, isn't it? No, no one ever is to blame here. The, the, the person who's suffering and the family who are trying to help them through it. Uh, we'll talk much more about the book, The Boy Between, in just a moment. You're listening to LBC. I'm Ian Dale. It's 17 minutes past nine. LBC. Stepping out of a hot, steamy shower, then wrapping yourself in a warm, soft, snuggly towel. At Swale Heating, we help you stay warm. Our expert engineers install efficient boilers, such as Worcester Bosch, with warranties of up to 10 years. And if it's an emergency, we can get the job done within 24 hours. Visit swaleheating.com. Rely on us to keep you warm. This might sound like a walk to work, but it's actually the sound of Paul being able to fit into last year's swimming trunks for this year's holiday of a lifetime. Whatever your reason for making a positive change in life, 
Vitality Health and Life Insurance motivates you with everything from half price trainers to weekly Cafe Nero coffees when you're active. Vitality, sharing the benefits of healthy living. Just search Vitality. Discounts and rewards available with certain plans. Minimum monthly premiums and conditions apply. Nip out to get bin bags. We've got some. Well, I better take the dog out. We don't have a dog. OK, OK. The Double Big Mac is back at McDonald's. Right, get the keys. The Double Big Mac is here for a limited time. Don't miss it. <laughs> Served after 11am. Subject to availability and participating restaurants until the 16th of November. It's time to start thinking about swapping your lounge for your lounger and spoil yourself rotten. And that's something a Saga Boutique cruise is rather good at. Boutique is your own VIP door-to-door -door chauffeur. Boutique is indulging in fine speciality dining in one of our restaurants. It's relaxing in the knowledge that travel insurance and cancellation cover for coronavirus is, of course, included. Go on, spoil yourself. There's still time to book a cruise sailing soon. Search Saga Boutique Cruises. Travel insurance provided by Great Lakes SE. Cancellation cover provided by Saga. Subject to medical screening. Opt-out option available. Over 50s only. Season C supply. Hey, Harry. Hello, mate. Should I back the underdog? We'll risk a few extra quid on the favourite. Listen, everyone knows that I like a bet, but if there's one thing I've learned over the years, it's this. No matter what the amount, no matter whether you're backing a player or buying a racehorse, your best bet is never to spend more than you can afford. That's why Betvictor's new affordability measures are specially designed to help you avoid ever spending beyond your means. Listen to Harry and please gamble responsibly. 18 plus, be gamble aware. <laughs> New season, new phone. With Vodafone Evo, you can get instant and guaranteed savings on a new plan when you trade in an eligible old phone using our trading tool. That way you can save on the latest selected smartphones in just three quick steps. Search Vodafone Evo to see how much you can save. Together we can. Vodafone. Vodafone Evo subject to phone and airtime plans. Trade in selected phones for monthly saving on eligible airtime plans. Credit by Vodafone Limited. Eligibility checks and terms apply. See vodafone.co.uk slash terms. Ian Dale on LBC. Text 84850. 20 past nine. We're talking to Amanda Prowse and Josiah Hartley about their book, The Boy Between, A Mother and Son's Journey from a World Gone Grey. I'm really interested in how you wrote this book because it's it sort of, it, well, it's alternate chapters, isn't it? Um, but I get the feeling that you both wrote things which the other one will have heard for the first time or will have read for the first time. That must have been quite a difficult process sometimes, but, and particularly you, I think, Josh, where you were writing things that you knew would cause a bit of pain. It was incredibly cathartic in some ways, um, you know, people say time, time is the great healer, which I've never fully, fully agreed with. But having a distance of years in some events, looking back, did really help me. But there was a lot of uncomfortable truths where I had to look, look mum in the eye and say, this is how it was, this is how I felt. And especially in the first couple of weeks, that was incredibly difficult. But we, we had some very frank conversations and decided we just need to do this as honestly and openly as possible. And it was your idea? Um, it was neither our dear hmm. idea, really. I thought I, thought it was, I, thought I read it was yours. We'd reached a bit of a um, headlock, to be honest. Progress wasn't really being made. And Mandy sent me an email saying, how can I help you today? And I responded saying, opening a window, get me a cup of tea, maybe change my bed linen. And Mandy responded, what, like you're ill? And I just replied, I am ill, Mum. And I think that sort of took a while for me to accept that I was ill. I saw a psychiatrist who uh, explained to me that I wouldn't, blame myself for getting cancer even though there are things you can do to mitigate your chances of getting cancer uh, you don't so don't blame yourself for getting depression it's it's another illness you know you've probably um, it's probably hereditary uh, a lot of factors and um, that allowed a change of mindset for me and allowed me to sort of look forward and think okay it's not my fault so what can I do about sort of fixing this illness and when I said that to Mandy about I'm ill I think that sort of you know click something in your mind as well Definitely. Um, that I was ill. But by the time um, this email exchange was over, we had about 20,000 words. And then one of uh, Mandy's editors came to the house and Mandy, without my knowledge, um, showed it uh, to the editor. And she said, this could be, this could be helpful. There's a, there's a book in here. And that's how mm. we started. And I was thinking, so while I was reading it, if I was a parent 
in the same situation. I would learn so much from this book. And indeed, if I was someone in your situation, Josh, as, as the, the, the child, uh, that there are so many things in, in here that people can learn from. And it is, and I think if you are... If you are in the middle of that, it's probably quite a, di a challenging read and you probably will only be able to read a chapter at a time. Whereas, I mean, I've read it really, I think I started it about a year ago because you, because of lockdown, we, we, we were supposed to have done this yeah. interview a year ago, but obviously we, we couldn't do it then. Um, wh wh when you were writing it, were you, were you aware of the potential audience for the book? Yes, but that, that was another thing separately. It felt weird that there was such a imbalance of information. As people I'd never met before, some of them across the globe, um, would know so much about me, and I'd know nothing about them. And that was something we had to accept early on. And that's been—it was frightening, but um, mm -hmm. it's such a such a privilege in many ways to receive messages from people in New Zealand or Australia and say. Because you must have had huge amounts of feedback. This book has helped me. My, but I also get heartbreaking messages saying my son is in the same position my daughter is at university. And it makes you feel helpless because there's just nothing I can do. Um, so it's a double-edged sword, but I am incredibly, I feel incredibly privileged to have helped, helped some people. How, um, I mean, I thought one of the most powerful passages was um, some, some of your school experiences and, and your, the, the, the relationships or lack of them that you had with people at your school. And then you moved to university which is where it really all came to a head, isn't it? And and then then you went to a different university, and I think made friends more more easily. But did you did you find it difficult to make that first move? And there's one one point in the book where you said, I think I think when you were at Bristol, you just thought, right, I'm I'm actually going to knock on this person's door, and you you heard that there were people in the room, I and mean, that must have been a really difficult thing for you to do. It was shocking. So many people say the school years the best, best years of your life. And I was like, well, if this is good as it gets, I might as well just stop now. Um, then I went, went off to Southampton University and I remember seeing people in the car parks or, or just in the, uh, in the corridors and they were chatting and they were meeting people for the first time and they were saying, let's go to the pub tonight or whatever it was. And I just remember thinking, what, what's wrong with you? Why can't you do that? Why can't you just go up to a stranger and say, hi, I'm Josh? Mm. And I just felt like I couldn't. And I slept for about two, two three days when, when I first got to... Freshers' week, so half of my freshers' week I was spent asleep, and um, yeah, I felt really isolated and just not like everyone else. And that must have been a really difficult period for you, so because you you knew the problems that Josh had, and yet you had to leave him at university. I mean, I can't imagine what that drive home must have been like. I honestly thought, once he's doing something he loves. Once he's out of the school environment, which didn't really suit him because it was he wasn't sporty and it was a sporty school, all of those little things that felt important at the time. Doing a subject he loved with like-minded people, this is going to be the time of his life. Mm. I thought it was going to be like a movie where they were going to be drinking and dancing and at the end of the degree, throw your hat in the air and everything's wonderful. And I honestly think I thought that's what it would be like for him in. And when he didn't answer a call or respond to a text, I could say to myself, well, he's probably out having a nice time he's probably dancing or out for supper or you know this is great this is what I want for him I didn't know that he was horizontal you know on a bed feeling very very alienated and that again you know that guilt is just absolutely huge because I didn't know I needed to go and scoop him up I didn't know I had to but I would have done and you you talk about how um, Amanda was sort of in your room on that first day, fussing around and sort of putting plants on the windows, so, which is what any mum would do, isn't it? And and yet, in a sense, you you were kind of blaming her in in a weird sort of way, weren't you? If it was that simple to fix, you'd have <laughs> fixed it years ago. Um, the trouble is when you don't know what to do. You think you need to do something. So if I make his environment nice. If I yeah. get him matching bed linen, if I give him a good plant, if I, you know, buy him a new shirt, everything's going to be great. And of course, that's that's crazy. It doesn't work like that. It can't work like that. Just like you can't physically heal someone by buying them a nice gift. You can't mentally. Mm. But um, I didn't know what else to do. So I did that. And, I mean, you hit rock bottom at Southampton, didn't you? Um, and it was, I think you... you almost describe what happened 
as an act of God where you were at your lowest point and were about to take your own life and Simeon arrived. Not to go into the details about how I was going to take my own life but for whatever reason and there was nothing special about that day I decided that was the day. Um, I hadn't left, I was living in a studio apartment by myself and I hadn't left. Um, it's hard because my, my, my memory is a bit fuzzy of that period but I don't think I'd left that flat in about three weeks. I hadn't showered, I was barely drinking water, um, thirst just failed me. Um, a, free, a few weeks prior to that I remember looking at my blinds and he's like oh it's day right now or it's night time but for at least a week that had, that had gone, the blinds were closed um, and it was just me alone with no stimulation and for whatever reason I decided that's the day, that's the day I was going to take my own life and for whatever reason I got a call from, from Simeon and it said um, I'm coming down for a meeting in Southampton and I was like, and he said I'll be here in 20 minutes and I um, was on the edge uh, and 20 minutes later he knocks on my door and he, I'll never forget his face he opens my door and sees sees one a man, a grown up who has fully just gone who hasn't looked after himself in weeks His it was putrid the, um, no, no one would it be fair to live in that flat and I, I'll, I'll never forget he took he took control and he took all options away from me like I was a toddler and it's odd to say but I'm incredibly grateful for that because I was in no right mind to, to make sort of those decisions. And he was like, right, you're coming home right now. You're coming home. We'll get a bin bag. We'll put some rubbish in it. We'll get get some clothes. But you're coming home right now. And um, I remember I wanted to fight, but I just didn't really know how or have the energy. So I just went with him for the best. And my um, the thoughts of taking my own life didn't didn't go away or anything like that. But it, it did feel comforting just to have someone who's got your back and almost all of those responsibilities taken away from you. You know, I, I sat in a seat, got got out of my house, and then went to bed. And even that change of scenery did help. Um, but that day, it was nothing but luck that, that saved my life on that particular day. And you were 13,000 miles away. Yeah, I was in Australia working on the um, I'm a Celebrity programme. And I got a call in the morning. And um, it was unusual for Simeon to call me. And you know, when you know someone very well, before they even say a word, you know something's either yeah. great or not great. And he said, um, he said, yeah, he said, I've, Josh, Josh was planning to take his own life. And I, I said, oh, I'm so, sorry, I, you know, I made him say it a couple of times because it just felt, well, that can't be true, that can't be right. And if that is had right... You, had you not feared that before, though? Um, I think that Josh was very good at lying to us about his mental state. So we would say, are you okay? He'd say, I'm fine. Do you need us to come down? No. Do you need anything? I'm good. And I believed him because I wanted to believe him. And I think, as we were talking about before, you know, we would see posts of Josh maybe on social media uh, a bit sloshed or with someone, with, with friends, and we thought, well, this is great. He's probably just having a lovely party. Mm. And I think that was incredibly naive of, of, of us, of me. I think I wanted to believe that was the truth, Ian. Um, I, I will never ever forget what, what that time was like and I, you know, obviously I'm incredibly thankful and I'll fight until my last breath to keep Josh on the planet that's my job and that's what I will do but when Josh then came home from uni I was so relieved I thought well that's it then we've, we've ridden the storm we've, 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 we've got over the worst this is fantastic now it will be wonderful but it wasn't. That was just the start of our journey. And I, I'd never heard anyone say, oh, I had a little bit of depression, but I'm fine now. Um, people said I struggled with depression or I suffered with depression. And I began to realise that this was the long haul. Uh, and it was a real shocker. Well, we'll talk more about uh, what happened then in just a moment. It's 9.32. Here's Sora Suleiman with the news headlines. 47 countries, including South Africa and Brazil, are going to be taken off the red travel list. From Monday, people arriving in the UK from most destinations won't have to quarantine in a designated hotel, costing them thousands of pounds. 
A charity is warning an extra one and a half million households could be pushed into fuel poverty if the energy price cap rises by £400 next April. Earlier, the business secretary says the move to greener energy would reduce bills. And there have been scenes of celebration outside St James's Park following the approval of a Saudi-led takeover of Newcastle United. The deal worth £300 million removes Mike Ashley as owner after 14 years. He's been trying to sell the club for 13 years. LBC weather, patchy rain across parts of Scotland and Northern Ireland through the night, dry elsewhere, a low of 14 degrees. Hey, Harry. Hello, mate. Any tips for the horses? It's going to be one hell of a race, that's for sure. Oh, sorry, mate. I've got Michael Owen on the line. Here, Michael. Hello, gaffer. What do you fancy in the big race today? Oh, I think the favourite will win it by a distance. I'm not sure he'd handle these conditions. I like the one at the bottom of the handicap. Your best bet is... Oh, sorry, lads, I've got to run. I'm teeing off in 20. Whether you listen to Harry or Michael, make your best bet at BetVictor. Search online for latest offers. 18 plus, be gamble aware. Please gamble responsibly. Why is it that most days seem to be one of those days? Non-stop from the get-go, and just when you think you've tackled all the needs tackling, it dawns on you. Dinner. Well, fear not, because you can pick up a Tesco and Jamie Oliver tray bake, a tasty meal for four, ready in 30 minutes. That's dinner sorted, and it gives you time to concentrate on the important stuff, like finally managing to get an early night. If only. Tesco. Every little helps. Available in selected larger stores, excludes Northern Ireland. Black coffee, please. Sure. Would you like the Fwambala beans with a shot of... Daily coffee costing a fortune. A McCafe regular black coffee is just 99p. Great coffee, great price. Not applicable to delivery orders. Price and participation may vary. Got the popcorn, Sergei? Oh, yeah. Now, what shall we watch? Ooh, a spy movie. <laughs> Whoa, where are we, Sergei? We're in the car chase. Oh, well, patch up. I need more leg room. Ooh, what does this button do? Eat it seats? No, no, no. Eject the seat! Switch your car or home insurance to compare the market today and get two-for-one cinema tickets. With a qualifying product, one membership a year, participating cinemas, Tuesday or Wednesday, two standard tickets only, cheap as free, T's and C's apply. So your accountant does your audit for you, looks at your accounts, calculates your tax, stuff like that. But do they look at your business model and give you long-term advice to help your business grow? And most importantly, are they looking after you, the owner? At Barnes Rofe, our partners get to know their clients and want to become part of their team. Is it time to see what we can do for you? Arrange your free consultation today at barnesrofe.com. Clever accountants for business. If you're struggling to get your instrument to perform in the moment, do something about it without the awkward conversations or silences. Perform when you need to with Newman. Clinically proven treatment, order online, discreetly delivered to your door. Visit newman.com today. N-U-M-A-N.com. This is LBC with Ian Dale. Call 0345 6060 973. 936. We're talking to Amanda Prowse and Josiah Hartley about their book, The Boy Between. And before we carry on with the story, what, one thing that really struck me throughout the book is Ben, in that he features in the book, but kind of doesn't feature in the book as, as much as, I don't know, maybe I thought, maybe, I, mean, I hope you don't mind me saying something, maybe I, I, I thought he should, because I thought the, the relationship between you all is absolutely fascinating, and particularly as, as younger children, where there's always bound to be sort of familial jealousies where, oh, well, oh, well you spent all your time sort of caring for him. What about me? Was, was there any of that as well? Yeah, very much <laughs> so. Um, and actually, it's only now Ben's older, Ben's 25, that he can say that he felt it was better just to keep his head down. Yeah. Because all the attention was, on, you know, when, when you're firefighting and someone's saying, can you make me a cup of tea? It's like, well, hang on a minute. I've got a fire over here. That can wait. And actually, I think a lot of Ben's needs were relegated in the face of Josh's battle. And I think definitely that was something that happened and that we are now addressing. And we talked to Ben. He's fabulous and he's very open and very placid and he's great. 
But I think certainly, I think that's what happened because depression became the foe. That was the thing we were all, you know, facing and concentrating on. Because there's, there's a fascinating period where you and Ben and others go on a trip to the Far East, but you split up and go to different countries. And I, was, I thought, well, that's quite interesting. I mean, what, can you t tell us a bit more about that? Because you went on this, what most people would think of as, as a trip of a lifetime, but you basically hated every minute of it. Absolutely, every minute. <laughs> <laughs> it was packing sleeping bags, unpacking sleeping bags. Every day was the same. Everything was beautiful. Everything was amazing. And I just didn't want to be there. Um, there were some days where even then I just stayed in bed and it was a trip to a, a temple or something amazing. And I just wasn't up to it. And I, I don't blame ben, ben in the slightest. He wanted to go to Vietnam and that's where he went. And I think he had an amazing time um, without me. And I went to Cambodia and I was miserable there. And it really solidified that this is a, it's a me problem. It's not, I'm not running away from this. It's not a destination. It's not a thing. It's in my mind. And how did he cope with that? And how did you relate to him? At the, I mean, not just on that trip, but, but, but more generally. He threw himself into university and I think he had a great time, but he, he rarely came home um, at that period. And it was, it was hard to relate to him because he seemed extremely happy, extremely social um, and just really having a great time. And whilst almost didn't feel like getting left behind by him, but certainly that he was doing a lot better than I was at, at that time. And that was really, no jealousy or anything like that, really great to see. Mm. But it does make you feel, you know, when you haven't left your bed in three days and he's you know, playing American football and doing great at university and just fully embracing life, really. Um, it, it was tough. And how do you get on with him now? Much, much better than we ever did. Um, it's really nice now that we've both sort of left university. It's nice. Um, I don't think we've ever got on this well. Um, and I do feel like if I could, I could sit Ben down now and we could talk about anything. And that certainly wasn't the case two, three years ago. Mm. So let's go back to the period after you came back from university. Um, you were living in, in Bristol and things really... I mean, went from bad to worse. Is that an accurate description? Mm. I mean, I kind of thought, as I say, once we got over the hurdle of Josh, um, he, his near miss, as we call it, things would get a lot easier, but they didn't. Um, he took to his bed. He didn't want to leave his room. If he did surface, he was skittish or sluggish, lumbering, eating alone, unwashed, dirty clothes, didn't want me in or near his bedroom most of the time, didn't talk to anyone just closed down. If my parents came to visit, he'd sort of come and say hi and then amble off. And it was like having um, a thing living in your house, not a person. Uh, it was very hard to communicate with Josh. There were days when I was frustrated, days when I got angry because I didn't understand it. And I'd think, why doesn't he just help me? Why doesn't he meet me halfway? Why isn't he having a shower? Because it's hard having someone like that living in a small house. It was very difficult. You know, Josh is a big guy. And... Um, I now understand how awful that was for Josh, but it was hard for all of us, actually. I mean, were, were there rows? Mm? Because you must have... I mean, you are... How can I put this? I mean, you, I imagine you can have a, quite a volatile side to you. Definitely. Um, screaming matches? No, not screaming matches. Arguments between Simeon and I. Because Simeon would say, you just need to let him be. And I'm saying, why doesn't he just try? And he's saying, because he can't try. Mm -hmm. And it took me a, a long while to understand that, that Josh was doing his very best just by remaining present. It took me years, I think, to understand that. I mean, the, the hero of this book is Simeon in so many ways. And that, I mean, he, I mean, there must have been times that you must have feared that all of this would really, could shatter your relationship. Lots of times. I mean, we've never come as close as we did because not only was it incredibly hard caring for someone with a mental illness without any idea of what to do next, but it put the most incredible pressure on us, you know, and I was doing a lot of TV and I was doing a lot of PR all over the world and I'd have to turn up and smile and be jolly and do the stuff I was known for, um, and, you know, write quirky magazine articles and all the rest of it. And all the time my heart was broken and my spirit was shredded and I would dread going home and... I couldn't also just leave him to pick up the pieces. I had to go home and face it, do what I could. But it was just very hard on everyone. 
but but there were also moments that gave you hope that things would change. I mean, there's a car journey you're on, and Josh asked you about your latest book, and that again gave you something to cling on to. That oh oh maybe this might be a breakthrough. I mean, even if he if he if he would ask about the weather or something in the future, maybe you know what what are we doing at Christmas? I think oh good, he's thinking about Christmas. This is great. It was in the future, and therefore he was going to you know likely still be mm. here. But I felt I, I didn't want to ever mention the word suicide. I didn't want to mention the word depression because I thought if I did, I might make it real. So I was very much head in the sand, trying to sugarcoat everything and keep everyone jolly and keep the plate spinning. Whereas actually, we needed to crash as a family. We needed to all just sink so that we could really talk about it openly and find coping strategies, which is what we've done. But I didn't understand that for the longest time. I thought it was least said, soonest mended, that awful phrase, that if I could just keep everyone smiling and make enough cups of tea and cook a lemon cake, everything was going to be rosy. And Josh, going back to that, um, the, the Josh who was experiencing it and the Josh who was sort of looking at the situation, do you remember sort of thinking about the, the damage that this was all doing to Simeon and Amanda's relationship? Yeah, definitely. And especially those false hope moments, if you like. I remember the when I first got on medication for my depression, Mandy thought it'd be a silver bullet. I take yeah. I take one I have one. I remember literally and it yeah. it was obvious it was gonna take Are you okay now then? <laughs> yes. <laughs> exactly. Literally I watched him take it in and I was like, How do you feel? It's like, oh for goodness sake. So clueless, yeah. I was saying that might take two to three weeks and you know, unfortunately that that it never got better for that particular drug. And um I remember the disappointment that was that was crushing on everyone because uh, it, it was uh, no secret that I was on medication at that time so even the wider family yeah like well how are you feeling today or how are you feeling and it was well I feel I feel I have severe depression and I have all the side effects of that particular medication I and mean, the medical side of this I think is fascinating where you were completely let down by your GP um, you went to see a psychiatrist, which you didn't really want to do, but actually that was a bit of a breakthrough moment, or it cer certainly comes across as that in, in the book. And he really seemed to, or you, or you felt that he understood you in a way that nobody else had. But then he prescribed this drug, which clearly didn't work for a long time, but even though the logical side of your brain must have said, well, OK, I need to get on another drug, you, you still you resisted it. Looking back, I was addicted to that drug, and I felt like a drug addict at times. I remember I tried to go cold turkey without much research, and I actually threw up my stomach lining at Paddington. And that was a time where I felt... I, I really felt like a drug addict, um, and not, not myself. I, I was dependent on it. I, mm. I went down to half a day, and I was looking forward to it. I even... Still today, I remember the taste and the smell of the drug and really looking forward to it. I used to chew it in my mouth because it would, it, the, the, in, it was more intense, the, the flavour of it. And um, it, was, it was just horrible because I was depressed and then addicted to something that was making me feel awful. Um, I was getting dizzy spells. I couldn't, I couldn't remember that much. I had this brain fog that was, you know, looking back, stopping me from even attempting to get better. Um, and I would say that medication, there's hundreds of thousands of different drugs, dosages, timings of dosages, um, and you will find one that works for you. I, I just didn't. And um, I decided uh, that what was right for me was, was not to be on medication. But I think there is something for you. And if um, I ever did fall back into severe daily depression, I think I would try. I'd, I'd try medication. I'd try different things. Um, but for me at that time, it just wasn't wasn't right. Well, in a moment, we'll talk about how you've got to where you are, 24 years old, talking to me for an hour on a national radio station, which I suspect three or four years ago, that would never have entered, entered your head. It's 9.46. Coming up at 10 on LBC, Ian Payne. UK energy bills could rise by as much as 30% next year. How are you going to cope? Ian Payne on LBC. 
Understanding foreign exchange and getting the best deal for your business can be difficult. That's why Eddie Mayer was joined by Head of Business Client Management at OFX, Jake Trask, to discuss how major events can affect the markets. Back in 2020, sterling dropped close to 13%, which is a huge depreciation. To find out more and learn how to get 24-7 access to a currency expert when trading overseas, thanks to OFX, head to lbc.co.uk. Love the feeling of being out on the road with the sun on your face and the wind in your hair? Get that feeling. Join the AA today. Our mechanics will usually get you going again in around 30 minutes of arrival. Plus, with unlimited call-outs, we'll always be there when you need us. Switch to the UK's number one breakdown service from £6 a month. We'll get you back on the road. Join today at the AA.com. New customers only. T's and C's apply. For number one verification, go to the AA.com slash UK's number one. Steady, go! The race is on. Can you do your grocery shopping as fast as gorillas can deliver? You're leaving the house. Gorillas are picking up your favourite products. You're running to the shops. Gorillas are coming on an e-bike. You're stuck in a queue. Cashier number nine, please. Gorillas have arrived! Fresh groceries and the brands you love in 10 minutes. Download the Gorillas app and use the code FAST for £10 off each of your first four orders. Minimum order £20. Check availability in your area. She was in a remote forest, using cinematic mode on her new iPhone 13 Pro to make a film. She goes to share it. Her signal bars drop. Her signal? No. Unable to upload her masterpiece. Kev what? No likes, no hearts, no love from her followers. No, not her followers. Don't worry. With the new iPhone 13 Pro on EE, you can film and share from almost anywhere on the UK's best network. Get the new iPhone 13 Pro on EE. Best for network performance verified. EE.co.uk slash claims. 94% coverage. It's finally time to let it all go, it go. with Disney's Frozen the Musical. The beloved magic of the movie is now the ultimate West End sensation, ready to give you all the chills. Love is an open door. Experience the epic story of friendship and sisterhood like never before. Disney's Frozen the Musical, now playing at the Theatre Royal Drury Lane. Book your tickets today at frozenthemusical.co.uk. Ocado's got an own range for your Sunday roast. Our kilogram of British lamb, your chance to boast. With all your favourite trimmings at a tasty price too, there's an Ocado just for you. With our own range carrots, just 40p a kilo, and a pack of three brown onions for 85p. There's an Ocado just for you. Geographical restrictions and delivery charge apply. Minimum spend £40. Ian Dale on LBC. 10 to 9 on L... 10 to 10, sorry. 10 to 10 on LBC. Uh, we're talking to Amanda Prowse and Josiah Hartley about their book, The Boy Between, A Mother and Son's Journey from a World Gone Grey. Um, it's been out for a year in paperback at 8 99 It's published by Amazon Publishing. Um, and I imagine that it's it's probably been the best-selling mental health book for, for many, many years. And, it, and if it isn't, it certainly deserves to be. But look, we've only got 10 minutes left, so I want to sort of turn to the more positive side because you are here. I mean, that is a positive in itself, isn't it? Because I know in the book you say, right, well, we've got through this day. Let's hope we get through tomorrow. Um, it's five years on from the, from the time that you, you tried to take your own life. Um, how have you got to where you are now? And, and where are you now? I have good days and bad days, but who doesn't? And I'm thankful to say that almost all of my days right now are good days. And I never thought I'd be saying that a few years ago. Um, but still, I take it a day at a time. And my message to people who are suffering right now is it doesn't feel like an achievement just being on Earth, but it, it is. When you don't want to be here, every single second counts. And take things literally minute by minute. And if you can do that, take it hour by hour and then day by day. And I'm grateful for right now I can take things month by month. And I allow myself to look into the future. But I know that when you're when you're in that place, you can't see tomorrow. Tomorrow doesn't really exist in your head. Um, so every every single second you are here is just it counts, and it's that's part of your road to recovery. Um, but it is hard, and unfortunately, there is no silver bullet. There's no everyone says go for a walk and spending time in nature and things like that are wonderful, but if that's 
not right for you, it's not right for you. Uh, and can you sense when you're going to be having a bad day or a bad few days? Is it something... Alistair Campbell uh, has told me many times that he just knows when it's coming and there's nothing he can do about it. And he knows how in the intensity of how it's going to be. Is, is that the same for you? Yeah, it can be. Um, some days I just know that tomorrow is going to be a write-off. And I'm not afraid to take a mental health day anymore. And what does that mean, a write-off? What, what happens? Um, I just, it's only for me that day. You can't focus on helping other people or even just being a member of society if you, if you can't function yourself. So I will just look after myself. And that might be having a three-hour bath. It might be going to sleep at five in the afternoon. But whatever I can to make that day um, as easy for me as possible, I will do. And I certainly wouldn't have done that a few years ago. And, and are you sensitive to that? Yeah, very much so. And literally, we, we've learned that the key is just to let Josh be. We, I don't have to try and fix him because actually I can't. You know, there's no, this isn't mm. a spoiler that there's no champagne, you know, pork, cork, cork popping moment at the end where we get to sit back and have a lovely, wasn't that horrible. Mm. We live it every day still. We just let him be and we're guided by Josh. We talk about it more. Um, we could be better at talking about it, actually, because, you know, when a few good days have slipped by, you think, oh, actually, we haven't mentioned it. But um, we're guided by Josh, and, yeah, that's it. We don't pressure him. You've also got a very important message for universities, I think, in this book, where you, you then, you, I mean, we haven't talked about this this part of the story, but you, you spent some time then at Bristol University living at home initially and then living in student residences. But Bristol had, I hope had rather than has, a, a real problem with, with student suicides. And you, you, you talk about that a bit. Do you just want to explain sort of how maybe universities can just recognise the problem more than maybe they have done in the past? There does need to be better safeguarding and there needs to be easier channels for parents to be able to get into contacts with halls especially and say, how are they doing? Are they going to lectures? Um, because in Southampton, um, you know, Mandy called my tutor and he said, legally, I can't tell you anything. Mm. And the truth is, I hadn't been to lectures in two, three months at that point. And, um, but Mandy couldn't know any of that um, legally. And it feels weird that at school, in a matter of weeks between school and starting university in some cases, um, you get every single thing, every information about your child. And then a couple of weeks later, you're allowed to learn nothing. And I think there should be an opt-in or maybe an opt-out scheme where you say, I'm... I allow my parents to know what I'm up to. I think that would save lives. Um, but Bristol, unfortunately, still has, I believe, the highest suicide rate in the UK. Um, and I've thought about it a lot, and I don't think there's an easy explanation of why. Um, but I do know the year, the year I left, all the all the funding got absolutely slashed. The um, the system's just getting worse and worse. Um, the waiting times for to see someone at the university can be months and months long three months for initial appointment, and I uh, was forced to have an appointment at Bristol. And it was, as I've said in the book, it's just a box-ticking exercise. Are you a danger to yourself? Are you a danger to others? And it was it was over in, I want to say, 10 to 15 minutes, and it was the full hour, and I was just there twiddling my thumbs, having having lied to this person, essentially. And um, it felt awful and just extremely pointless. And it's, there's, no, there's no quick fix. But I think the, the biggest thing we can do is is to just open up communication between tutors and halls and, and parents. I also thought, part way through the book, what what if you hadn't had the parents that you have got? What if you had been somebody who, for whatever for whatever reason, was on on their own? And I mean, the the system let you down anyway. Give, I mean, given what happened with the GP and various other incidents in the book but if you're on your own there's no one there is there that's why it's so important it's not just you know well, actually there is someone there there's samaritans there we, are, we, we, we I, ought I to give out their number as well because if you're going through something yeah. similar and um you want to get in touch with the samaritans they're there 24 hours a day seven days a week uh, the number is 116123 or if you you can write an email to joe jo at samaritans.org or you can chat online at samaritans.org but the, the support structures just aren't there, are they? And, and, and you, you are almost entirely reliant on family. And I, I think, contrary to what you, I think, think of yourself, I think you did what any mother would do. And But 
you had the support of Simeon, you had the support of your wider family, but not everyone has that, do they? No, they don't. And the Samaritans are amazing. And charities like Mind and Calm and all the others who are, are, who are there, you just need to reach out to them. Mm. And actually, that's really key, reaching out, taking the step that Josh found so hard, talk to someone, open up the dialogue, send an email, whatever, but you need to talk to someone. you know. And it's not just a hashtag, it's about looking out for each other. Josh, do you feel optimistic about the future? Um, no, on a on a wider side, on a wider scale, absolutely not. And I think it's hard uh, to feel optimistic when you look at the state of the news right now. Uh, on a personal level, on a day to day, week to week basis, I feel personally optimistic. But I think that's what I meant, really. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, but I think not a lot of people my age feel optimistic right now with everything going on. With everything going on, I think it's hard to find hope. Um, and that's going to be incredibly hard, hard to fix. But we'll, we'll just see what happens. I think also, though, Ian, it is possible to live a good life with depression, and that's important. It doesn't mean it's the end of your life. It doesn't mean you mm. have a sad or miserable life. Just like any other illness, you can live with it, cope with it, control it, and lead a good life, and that's very important. Well, I could talk to you both for the next hour, but Tom Swarby might have something to say about that. So I think uh, we'd better wrap it up there. Thank you so much, both of you, for being so open and honest. I know from the texts and tweets that I can see coming in, people have really appreciated the, the, the openness that you've approached this with. And it's all in the book. It's called The Boy Between. It's by Amanda Prouse and Josiah Hartley, A Mother and Son's Journey from a World Gone Grey. And it's only eight ninety nine.